Okay, welcome everyone to the uh, public meeting on uh, acquisition at NTCO with uh, Minister Schumann. Before we start, I'd like to ask Mr. Van Thine if he could uh, open up with a prayer. Thank you. Lord, we thank you for this day and the many blessings we have received. We thank you for the ability to use our minds and work together to create strong and healthy communities. We thank you for looking over our constituents and all who we serve. Lord, we pray for all in our communities who are hungry, who are ill, who live in violence. As this meeting begins, Lord, please provide each person here with clarity of mind, creativity, compassion, integrity, and a sense of humor. Lord, give us listening ears, thoughtful words, and an open heart as we meet here today. Amen. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Van Thine. Um, I'd like to uh, start off with uh, introductions uh, by the uh, members of uh, Priorities and Planning Committee. Um, and also, uh, I'd like to uh, recognize um, Minister Siebert, who's sitting in for uh, getting information. Uh, so I'd like to start off with Mr. Blake. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Frederick Blake, MLA for McKenzie Delta. Welcome. Uh, welcome. Shane Thompson, the Hindu. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Corey Vanthine, MLA for Yellowknife North. Good afternoon. Welcome. Danny McNeely, Saad, to MLA. Good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, Michael Nelly, MLA for Detroit. Warm welcome. Uh, Lou Siebert, Tabacha, as observer only. Uh, Kevin O'Reilly, Frame Lake. RJ Simpson, Hay River North. Uh, thank you, thank you, everyone. Um, uh, before we uh, maybe adopt the agenda, I just ask if uh, Minister Schumann would like to introduce uh, his uh, delegation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. With me is Mr. Paul Geit, Deputy Minister of Public Works, and uh, to my far right is uh, John Vandenberg, Assistant Deputy Minister of Public Works. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Schumann. Um, uh, we will move to item four on, on the agenda and ask uh, Minister Schumann if you have any opening remarks. Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'd like to thank the Standing Committee on Priorities and Planning as well as others in attendance for their time today. I'd like to address the committee today to discuss the Government of Northwest Territories' decision in December to purchase the core assets of Northern Transportation Company Limited, once the largest marine transportation service provider in the Northwest Territories. This company that for 80 years provided critical marine transportation services to communities and resource exploration projects along the Mackenzie River and across the Western Arctic shut down operations in 2016. Given the possible impacts to the communities that rely on this service, the GNWT felt timely and a decisive action was required. The company delivered essential petroleum products and cargo to 10 Northwest Territories communities including four communities to which fuel and large cargo can be delivered economically only across the water. For these communities, there is no economical alternative for the supply of diesel fuel to the power plants of the Northwest Territories Power Corporation. For these communities, the cost to provide sufficient fuel and large cargo materials by air is prohibitive in some cases not possible. When Public Works and Services was made aware of the challenges facing the company, Work began to develop a tender for marine resupply services. We knew of a smaller barging operations in the north and of larger southern operators and were encouraged by early interest in the tender. However, as the department will explain in more detail shortly, the market quickly demonstrated that smaller operators did not have the capacity to operate in the northern river and marine environment without access to specialized marine assets, and the larger operators were unwilling to commit to our market. The importance of a viable Mackenzie River Marine Transportation Service in the Northwest Territories cannot be understated. Where Canada's northernmost railhead ends, Canada's northernmost inland port, there is a loading terminal, a large shipyard, and maintenance facility able to serve the tug and barge fleet and the Canadian Coast Guard. This shipyard and its marine assets provide critical supplies to some of the NWT's most remote and most vulnerable communities. Our priorities right now are to ensure that the Northwest Territories residents who rely on marine transportation for essential goods and services get those supplies at a reasonable cost and get them without fail. 
We have the capacity, resources, and experience to accomplish this. The purchase of these assets was made out of necessity, but it has also revealed potential opportunities. Opportunities for improved marine infrastructure, opportunities for meaningful jobs, opportunities for business revenues that can, be stab that can stabilize the cost and essential services, and an opportunity to preserve the last link of the intermodal supply chain that stretches all the way from the Gulf of Mexico to the Mackenzie Delta. These things benefit Northerners. Today we will recount the rapid series of events leading up to the purchase, explain where we are now as we prepare for the 2017 sailing season, and lay out a vision for the future. Mr. Chair, with your permission, I would now like to introduce the Deputy Minister of the Department of Public Works and Services, Mr. Paul Guy, who will provide you with a detailed presentation and afterwards, we will be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Schumann. Um, if there are no questions on the opening uh, remarks, I uh, will go to uh, Ms. Mr. Guy. Mr. Guy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to be here <coughs> to provide uh, an update on the acquisition and, uh, and future operations associated with the former NTCL assets. Um, I wanted to start on slide two uh, with a bit of history of NTCL. They were founded more than 80 years ago, providing tug and barge services since 1936. They were a federal crown corporation for 36 years. In 1985, they were sold to the Uvialo Development Corporation and Nunacy Corporation, and business declined uh, really over the past 10 years. Uh, many challenges for them in their operating environment uh, and in the economy in which they served uh, marine transportation services. Nunacy sold their share into IDC in 2014, uh, and NTCL filed for creditor protection in the spring of 2016. The company finally came bankrupt and ceased to exist at the end of December 2016, so five weeks ago or so. As the previous owners of the fleet, they provided critical marine transportation services to our most vulnerable communities and to resource exploration projects. They also provided critical support to the Department of National Defense. And they operate, as the Minister said, out of Hay River, Canada's northernmost ship, shipyard at Canada's northernmost railhead. Um, moving to slide three, I want to provide also a little bit of background on our contract that we had with NTCL. We had established in 2013 a seven-year petroleum product supply transportation and delivery agreement uh, with Northwest Transportation Company Limited uh, for seven years, and this was established through the competitive process. It's important to note that this was for the delivery of GNWD contracted fuel, the supply and delivery of fuel to our petroleum products served communities and to those uh, communities where NTC, NT PC, the power corporation, required fuel for power generation purposes. It was really associated with delivery of fuel only and it did not include any sort of contract for general cargo services or anything like that. Um, the eight communities that this contract was required to serve was Anuvik, Tuck, Tayuktuk, Toledo, Fort Good Hope, Saks Harbor, Politak, Wilhuktuk, and Lutzelke. Uh, the products they carried were heating fuel, diesel fuel, power generation fuel, gasoline, and aviation fuel. And they also provided private sector services to those that needed fuel for the private sector market communities, places like Inuvik, Klavik, and uh, Fort McPherson. In March 2016, about 11 months ago, NTCL declared that they were unable to continue the existing contract. They were about, uh, just about to start the third year of the seven-year contract. Uh, the department was put in a, in a position where they're oblig, obligated to negotiate a new signal season contract with NTCL, and it turned out that it was at more than two and a half times the previous freight rates. This one-year transportation contract was for the 2016 season only, and it was required to allow for the continued service last year. So it was really just to bridge that season. Without that contract, they would have probably not provided any service at all last year. NTCL declared that they would also ceased business at the end of the 2016 season. And they were at that time uh, seeking uh, to actively sell the company. So they were looking for buyers of the company on the open market. Uh, uh, upon uh, 
receiving notice of the termination of the contract, we went into immediately, and I'm on slide four now, a competitive process uh, to secure a new marine transportation uh, uh, supplier. So in May 2016, we released a tender to establish a new seven-year fuel supply contract for marine transportation contract that would begin in 2017. And again, it was to serve those same communities, Saks Harbor, Willow, Duck, Politoc, Fort Good Hope, Toledo, and Lucille Cay, as well as the NTPC communities where they need fuel in Tuktoyuktuk and Inuvik. We had 40 parties uh, that downloaded those tender documents, and we received multiple requests from potential bidders to keep the tender open and extend it. These requests were considered, and we adjusted the closing date to November 4th, 2016. Uh, when we closed the tender, we only received one bid, and it was from an Alberta company. Uh, the contract uh, tender that we received was ultimately not uh, compliant. Um, the sole bidder put conditions outside the terms and conditions of the contract that, that made it non-compliant. Um, as a side note, the bidder was not in the marine business and did not own tug and barge equipment at that time, and uh, that was certainly uh, not, not a factor in the disqualification, but it was something that we considered as going forward. We did contact at that time all the other bidders who had considered most likely to bid some of those which had asked for an extension, and all declared that they were either did not have suitable marine equipment to perform this work or that they would not acquire the equipment to do it or they simply chose not to bid for uh, business reasons. Uh, which brings us then to November of 2016, which is about three months ago. Just after we closed uh, the contract, um, uh, we, um, sorry, we, we, we started to look at what our options were going forward, and we noted that in a non-compliant bid that we would, uh, the, 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 the cost of transportation fuel would be going up significantly <coughs> under that sort of proposal. Uh, the price increase that was in that bid was about $5 million a year for our PPD cert communities only, so for the transportation of community fuel under the PPD contract, we would be looking at about $0.30 cents a litre increase for heating fuel, diesel fuel, uh, motor fuel. We didn't know or have any indication what the impact would be on dry goods or what it would be on any of the other non-GNWT um, customers, for example, the private fuel suppliers in Anuvik and Klavik, uh, Norman Wells, for example, where it's private sector operation. Um, that would then brought us to um, uh, slide six. Um, Petroleum products, which are essential to provide the electricity generation, home heating, and transportation of community members, well, project and project materials for government and private sector projects to be completed. There is really no uh, comprehensive private market alternative to provide the services. There's limited options for movement of project materials with the NWT. There's very two small operators that provide dry cargo barging services on the Mackenzie River. They do a very good job. They provide an essential service. But neither of them which have the equipment that can operate in an ocean environment, and they don't have the equipment necessary to carry bulk petroleum products. To accomplish this marine resupply in the Mackenzie River area and outside of the Delta, the NTCL assets are really the only specialized and unique marine fleet consisting of shallow draft, high horsepower tugboats, various barges, land-based loading and storage equipment, and the conventional marine equipment, uh, marine equipment that exists elsewhere in the industry, whether you look at BC Coast or on the West Coast, or that's used to serve many of the Nunavut communities, is not uh, suitable uh, to operate in, in the shallow marine environment, which this equipment is designed and purposely built for, particularly in the communities like Saks Harbor and Politech. So if you're going to replace this marine equipment, it has to be custom built, cannot be readily or cheaply replaced or purchased easily on the used market. Uh, and once you own this, this equipment, particularly in this area, you have what is essentially a virtual monopoly, monopoly on the marine resupply, particularly around for petroleum products. And our concern, of course, is that the party that owns these assets would have significant market power over an essential service, which could provide risk to both the cost of resupply and the implicit reliability. Um, when we get to the sale of the assets, 
Um, under the court restructuring creditor protection process, the IDC group were permitted to attempt to sell the assets of NTCL during the summer of 2016. Uh, they did sell some of their non-critical or non-core assets to NTCL tugs were sold, a support vessel, a few barges that were suitable for operating in the, air in the ocean were sold. These assets were sold to parties outside of Northwest Territories. The core fleet of tugs and barges and the buildings and lands were not sold. We monitored the process closely during the fall, speaking with the I I Anubiate Corporate Group about the assets. We became increasingly concerned that these assets had not been brought locally and might be purchased by a party that would remove them from the NWT. By early November, we were advised that by the ICG that the assets would turn over to a receiver appointed by the court. It was assumed at that time that there would be plenty of time to discuss with the receiver and continue if a GNWT purchase or next steps for these assets would be warranted or how their uh, disposal would be considered. Um, what uh, came, uh, uh, when you turn to slide eight, on December 6th, we became aware through the court process that in fact, a sole bid for the assets in the amount of 2.0 million was going to be considered on December 15th, which was contrary to what we were led to believe earlier on. And we felt that there was a large disparity between the offering and the estimated value of the assets. We were also unclear on what capability intentions of the potential buyer and buyer might be, given the, these assets are unique and of strategic value to the NWT and felt that they needed to be protected. Going to slide um, number nine. Uh, we were a number of other concerns. Uh, we we're also in the back of our mind, based on our previous tender process, we were sensitive about higher prices uh, for delivery of fuels and cost of living. We were also concerned about monopoly operator and what is really an essential service. We were concerned about a risk to the market that doesn't have viable opportunities. There is really no other competition, particularly for delivery of fuel. We were also worried about a risk of a business failure and discontinuation of service, uh, that a weekly financed operator could purchase the assets and be unable to deploy or sustain the operation. We also were very much concerned that these assets could be bought, parted out, and they could uh, be sold off and leave the territory. And then in the back of our mind was ensuring that the critical services that uh, communities rely on would not be interrupted. One other concern, of course, was that the assets could be used to support private interests and not be available to serve the public good. Um, and I think the recent example from our contract, the fact that NTCL did have a virtual monopoly, allowed them to break their contract, um, allow them to raise their rates for that single year, uh, was indicative of a situation we wanted to be in a position to avoid going forward. So it was something that was in the back of our minds as we considered the situation. On December 13th, on slide 10, the Financial Management Board approved permission to place a bid on the core assets of NTCL. Uh, through the court proceedings and our legal advisors, we were advised that the court would not <coughs> consider a bid unless it was substantially higher than the 2.2 million bid. Um, uh, our initial offer was for 4.5 million, as we indicated in our earlier correspondence to uh, committee. Uh, the court uh, did review both offers and then ordered both parties to come back with a final offer that later that afternoon. And of course, we offered 7.5 million and the court did ultimately accepted that. The question could be asked, how did we arrive at the price of 7.5 million? We, we looked at the, the core list of assets. We had a number of uh, employees, uh, both in our department and uh, in Department of Transportation, as well as in the industry, uh, advisors who have extensive knowledge of these assets. We've worked alongside these assets for many years. Uh, folks in our department have 20 plus years working in senior management roles at uh, NTCL. They have fairly good knowledge of the hardware, the condition, um, the unique nature of the assets. And we <coughs> felt that that bid, uh, based on our knowledge and review and the industry um, valuations on these type of assets elsewhere that 7.5 million was a reasonable uh, number for us to uh, seek approval to go forward with. Um, 
We also knew that in the summer of 16, 2016 that there was another bid uh, that was provided to the ICG and their uh, financing company in the range of $7 million that was not accepted. That bid was not brought forward to the court at a later date, so whatever the terms and conditions were there did not proceed. Uh, the special warrant, as you know, uh, in order to make timely counteroffers, we were driven very much by a very short period of time imposed by the courts. This came to our attention at very late in the stages in December 6. Uh, we needed to uh, determine whether we wanted to go forward. We developed our, our bid uh, pricing, and then we sought FMB approval, and of course we needed a special warrant. Um, recognizing the court and post deadlines. There were no opportunities to extend the court dates. There were no opportunities to have court defer this until we could have further time to consider it. Time was at that point at the essence of the court wanted to conclude the process. Uh, we will be recording or have recorded a budget adjustment, increasing our department capital budget by 7.5 million. On slide 12, uh, it's important to note what we did buy and what we didn't buy. So we bought tugs, barges, equipment, lands, and building. We did not buy the business goodwill or customer contracts. We did not buy outstanding accounts payable. We did not buy the tax debt. We didn't buy the pension debt. We did not inherit employees or employees' obligations. Um, but what we did buy in the next few slides just give you a bit of an overview of the assets. Part of the bidding process, uh, we didn't have an opportunity through that process to select the core assets that we would have wanted. Uh, the court was interested in completing the process. They wanted a conclusive deal, and they were looking for bids that accepted all the, all the assets. So initially, we had in indicated that we wanted to go forward with the bid on a, on a list of core assets. We felt we needed to provide the service going forward, but we did not have an option. It was take all or essentially take nothing. What we bought, we bought eight tugboats, each 5,000 horsepower shallow draft, one harbored yarding tug fitted with bow thrusters, two buoy tender vessels, which are former Coast Guard ships. All the marine vessels that we bought are in the process of being registered with the ship's registry in accordance with the provisions of the Canada Shipping Act. Uh, we are in the process of identifying each asset term in its current market value and operational need. We have the Department of Finance Risk Management established that our assets are insured under existing policies for a period and have secured marine liability insurance are working with underwriters to put a physical value coverage in place for the operating system. Also on slide 14, what else would we buy? 82 plus barges and quite clearly we have more assets than we need to deliver goods to communities in Northwest Terriers and to do uh, ancillary business. Some of the equipment is obsolete and where assets are not likely to be required for current or future operations, we'll determine how to be best divest ourselves of those GNWT assets. Um, slide 15 talks about some of the, uh, the real estate. Uh, we bought the terminals and lands in Tuktoyuktuk, in Inuvik, Norman Wells, Hay River. We also bought 700 sea cans, uh, shipping containers. They have a wholesale value of about $1.5 million. Uh, many of them are leased and their revenues being generated through those going forward. There's, uh, we discovered there's a uh, million dollars worth of fuel that came with these assets and for operational uh, purposes. Essentially, it's the fuel that is used to, to uh, power the fleet. Uh, so we have that in inventory. We also got all of the mobile equipment, light trucks, heavy equipment, forklifts, pickup trucks, flatbed trucks, tractors, ramps, light towers, and related equipment. Vessel support and cargo handling equipment, work boats, rescue craft, inventories of vessel supplies. There's a significant amount of inventory we're discovering of spare parts, um, uh, new, new, new inventory, uh, operational equipment. Uh, the specialized equipment for handling fuel was also purchased as part of the, uh, the, the uh, surplus assets. <coughs> We've taken steps to secure all the buildings, changing locks. Put, uh, putting regular inspections in place. We have regular checks going on in Hay River, Norman Wells. We have a contract in place to do daily checks in Tuk Tuk Tuk. Slide 16 is the shipyard in Hay River, and that really consists of the synchro lift, ship repair hangar, an office complex, crew accommodations, building and mess hall, cargo lay down acreage, the rail spur, and various outbuildings. 
Bay River Shipyard Repair Hangar is it's a, it's it's a facility that's used to bring vessels in for overhaul. It's been recently used to service and repair Coast Guard vessels. The federal government the Coast Guard um, relies on relies on that facility, and it's a service that they will likely be looking to procure going forward. That facility is also suitable for manufacturing barge and, and boats. Well, it is in operational condition, and uh, it is uh, being currently maintained by PWS forces. The synchro lift is a unique asset on slide 18 that lifts the tugs out of water for movement into the ship repair hangar for service. So that's what that looks like. One of the issues that's been discussed and raised is the issue of the uh, environmental liabilities and the environmental issues associated with these assets. The assessment of the environmental liabilities have been undertaken over the next three summers. Phase one environmental site assessments have been completed for all the sites with leases on commissioners and territorial lands. We're going to be following up that work with phase two ESAs on 27 leases, then it will occur over the next three summers and determine any, whether any remediation, future remediation activities are required. Phase three ESAs will be carried out uh, as required uh, through the environmental liabilities process. Depending on results of these fa phase three ESAs, for some of the sites, we will have the option of approaching Canada and negotiate responsibility for remediation of the devolution final agreement, and we will be pursuing those options where, where appropriate and if necessary. We're currently working to complete an inventory and review of the property's purchase. It's important to note that prior to the purchase of the properties, it was established that the parcels operating on public lands were in compliance with current authorizations. We confirmed that with the Department of Lands. As we review properties, we'll determine their condition and follow up as necessary on issues that may be of concern for health, safety, and the environment. We have a significant amount of corporate knowledge and expertise in managing these issues, and we will use that knowledge and expertise to undertake these activities. Uh, looking forward, and I think we'd like to focus on this, Mr. Chair, under operations for 2017, uh, now that we've secured the assets, we realize, uh, we know when we have to take actions for the essential services delivered for this season. We're preparing to manage the maintenance operation of the fleet and define a 2017 program. We intend to contract a marine crewing service to provide crews to operate and maintain the vessels for this year only. Crewing service will provide the marine engineers and trades to prepare the vessels for operation. They will be employing uh, the personnel. These people or employees will be employees of the crewing contractor, not the employees of the GNWT. They will be professional uh, marine um, staff and they will be choosing to hire, I think, uh, my understanding is from the experienced former NTCL crews that have done this work for many years before. They'll be expected to open office in Hay River uh, to support that activity for the coming summer. And um, it's important to note that we're making sure that they have all the necessary qualifications of the highest standards uh, for safety um, and uh, operational proficiency. Um, there's a question that could be asked, I guess, and we have considered this, why do we not go to the marketplace to solicit an operator to manage and operate the whole business? Well, that's not outside of the question going forward. When we bought the assets on December 21st, it was critical that we secure them, identify what we actually bought, inventory the assets, develop a maintenance plan, a sailing schedule, define the requirements for this coming season and initiate the vessel registration process. Um, we quickly realized that it would be impossible or to, to draft an RFP without having that basic information to include in a tender or an RFP document. Mm -hmm. Given the short period of time between advertising for sailing, developing a sailing schedule, having this available so that those communities and residents that need to use this service, we would not have had sufficient time to go through a procurement process to get a turnkey operator for the assets. Last year's experience going to marketplace for marine resupply of petroleum products taught us, taught us that there's a number of limited number of capable operators who may or may not be interested. And then we had no certainty that we would have success finding a contractor for this year and if we went through a lengthy procurement process. For, 
This year we felt we really didn't have the luxury of time to do this process. We had a pressing need and only five months to prepare these tugs and barges. Looking beyond 2017, I think we need to develop a longer term business model. We're, we're going to be informed by much of the work that we would be doing this year in the 2017 operating system. We'll consider engaging experienced established marine operators. Consider continuing with core program management staff with vessel operation and maintenance by accruing service. We'll need to generate a self-sustaining revenue to reinvest in the fleet and facilities and increase the value and reliability of government assets. In terms of the actions we've taken in the first 30 days, uh, we have the core program management team in place. We have a marine crewing service engaged. Registration of the tugs and barges has begun. Requirements for the sa sailing season have been defined. Draft sailing schedule and operational program developed for 2017. Cargo office is established and underway in Hay River. We established that in the uh, in, in actually in the synchro lift facility. We have a 1-800 number that's been established, and we're about to put a website uh, up that will allow people to access this information. Uh, going forward, uh, we are seeking supplementary appropriations to fund the 2017 operations. There's a request in for 2016-17 for uh, a modest amount to fund this year. Uh, the work that I just spoke about in 17-18, we have, uh, are seeking funding to uh, fund the operation of the service that will be offset by the revenues that we generate through the provision of the service. It's important to note that the supplementary appropriation is, is funding that will only be used to provide that service and it will be recovered. Uh, when we came up with the dollar value of the appropriation, we had to consider what the maximum likely amount of service we would provide in 2017 uh, so that we would be adequately resourced to do that. Um, should we provide a smaller amount of service than we uh, have, have uh, allocated for, then obviously we will not expend the operations money uh, to do it. This is really to crew the vessels, to fuel them, and to operate and maintain them. So if they're not being used, we will not need that money. One of the things we can consider going forward, and we're looking at options, and we'll like be returning to speak to community about this at a committee at a future time is, is options for operating this going forward. We could consider, for example, a revolving fund model similar to the patrolling products uh, program where we can um, account for the revenues and fund the operations through that operated in a revolving fund model. There are a number of other models that could be considered as well, and we'll be working on that this fiscal year. Um, in the interest of time, Mr. Chair, I'll jump to just slide 26. I think it's important to note who the customer is. It's really the fuel to the GNWD communities, primarily GNWD buildings and works for heating, power corp for power generation, community governments, patrolling products program in non-market communities, fuel to the private sector in the communities. Many of that is around construction and contracting businesses, the airlines and their fuels, other transporters privately owned buildings and homes for heating, and the fuel and the vendors in the market community. It's also the deck cargo on slide 27. Similar, similar customer profile, private sector and public sector in those, those uh, communities that are not served by road. Going forward, I think some of the opportunities that we see here, uh, there is some certainty around the delivery of essential service. What we're finding from many of the um, customers and clients that have been reaching out to us that there was so much uncertainty around the former operator that they were finding other ways to get their goods and services. So although um, there may have been convenience using the Mackenzie River for them, uh, they were finding other ways because they weren't sure about the certainty of that supply route going forward. So they are, they are now starting to reconsider the Mackenzie River as a viable option. Opportunities for economic development, support for northern businesses. There is also possible federal funding for critical marine infrastructure. And there are sources of revenue that can be used to offset the operating costs and perhaps lower the cost uh, for the ENWT residents that use this service as well. The GNWT investment, I'm on slide 29, Mr. Chair. Um, in, in this port and fleet also signals to the federal government that we value and support the Mackenzie River as a corridor for commerce and transportation. There is funding that may be available to the three territories for improvements to our northern marine infrastructure through Canada's Oceans Protection Plan. Uh, this uh, acquisition and this uh, movement into this area for the GNWT will provide, I think, uh, a positive signal when applications are made in the future for funding under that program. Financial support from federal government is critical for the dredging and improving the landings and wharves, as well as charting and navigational age. 
Uh, business development, NWT businesses procuring, uh, com pursuing commercial opportunities and use areas to support that through this initiative. I also encourage them to compliment CN, as my understanding has made significant investments in the rail line to the NWT. They are interested in increasing the intermodal supply chain from Alberta to the Mackenzie Delta. And I think this will help encourage uh, CN to make further investments in their infrastructure as well. There are opportunities to consider serving Coast Guard and Department of National Defense, which will help generate revenues to offset uh, those other costs that we incur. Uh, last two slides, Mr. Chair. On slide 31, it's important to recognize that while we're well underway in establishing this season, there are some challenges we face going forward. Recognize that there there's many opportunities, but there are challenges. For example, uh, when NTCL is in financial dis difficulty and able to pay their, their debts, it's not unusual for companies to leave work unfinished uh, uh, to minimize costs. And one of the, I think, uh, issues that we face right now is that vessels were uh, winterized and left uh, at the uh, Inubic end of the river. So normally they would return to Hay River where they could be maintained and prepared for the coming season. So some of that work we will have to do in Inuvik and have done on site where they are currently safely stored and secured. So we may have to bring some of them back up the river for some maintenance after the river breaks up and that's one of the challenges that we're facing. In terms of the short term and the long term, on closing on slide 32, our priority is to ensure that the 2017 sailing system continues successfully. Uh, and that is delivering essential goods and services to our most vulnerable communities. Our focus is on the communities that the GNWT uh, needs to serve, uh, and uh, any other business will be second priority for us this fiscal year. Helping mitigate the cost of living increases for residents and reduce the risk of non-delivery, making strategic investments in transportation infrastructure, and in the future, of course, we need to develop a self-sustaining profitable business model that can help the diversify and expand the NWD economy. Uh, that concludes my presentation, Mr. Chair. Thank you, and we welcome to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Guy. Um, we're going to open up the floor for questions from the members. Uh, Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you mentioned that a five to eight person core management staff will be needed. How many of these will be new hires as opposed to transfers from uh, other departments? So how many new positions will be created? How many have been hired so far and are, are these going to be permanent year-round positions? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Simpson. Mr. Uh, Mr. Minister Schumann. Through you, I'd like to pass it on to Mr. Vandenberg. Thank you, Minister Schumann. Mr. Vandenberg. Here. Um, Yes, uh, at this time uh, we've settled on a, a, a number of individuals who have the skills and expertise to do this. In uh, a couple of cases we have uh, employees who, who are existent within the government who would need to be moved into this, uh, this activity. Uh, they would uh, then need to be backfilled. They do have jobs. Uh, we've uh, a couple of new, brand new hires and in those cases at this point we have the number of four, uh, likely five coming on and those would be year-round employees at this point. Uh, we uh, qualified that by saying it could be up to eight because we don't exactly know the scope of what we would be facing going forward, but we yeah, we're comfortable with that. Mr. Vandenberg, anything to add, Mr. Guy? Yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. In terms of those employees, we have a strength. I think we brought them on through the casual staffing process. Um, they are employees that have extensive knowledge around this business. They work for the company for many years in the area of Korean. Uh, uh, cargo operations, cargo scheduling, uh, the individual that was responsible for all of the paperwork around the regulatory requirements of keeping the, um, the vessels properly certif certified. Uh, they are Hay River residents and they've been brought on casual. Going forward, the business model and the staffing, we would be seeking support of a uh, committee through the normal business plan process. So new positions, of course, would be established and staffed and would be either appropriated uh, through the normal business plan process. So going forward, I think we would bring forward more information and better model as we develop into the business plan process. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Guy. Uh, Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your answer. So you, you mentioned the Public Works is contracting a marine crewing service to provide the crews. Uh, are these crews going to be GNWT employees? And uh, what steps has Public Works taken to ensure that these hires will be local when at all possible. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. 
Uh, Mr. Guy. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, no, these uh, individuals will not be GNW employees. It's a contracted service. I would uh, uh, ask Mr. Vandenberg to elaborate on the, the staffing of local employment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Guy. Mr. Vandenberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Many of the employees that work for NTCL for many years have the required qualifications. As you probably know, we're moving millions of liters of fuel and thousands of tons of cargo down the Mackenzie River. So it's very important that people have the, uh, the appropriate uh, qualifications, including meds, uh, certificates to be captains, mates, etc. cetera. Um, so uh, indeed, where possible, uh, the, uh, the instructions are to, to draw upon existing NTCL employees, as we know a number of them do live in Hay River and in, in the Northland. Uh, so it, it, it would be to every everyone's advantage for them to do that, and that is the instruction going forward, uh, where it's possible to fill those, uh, those positions with people of the required qualifications. Thank you, Mr. Vandenberg. Mr. Simpson? Uh, thank you. So no assurances, but uh, just by the, the fact that there are so many experienced people, I'm sure that many will be, will be hired. And uh, I'll, I'll pass it on after this, but you said the crewing service will open an office in Hay River. When will this happen? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Simpson. Mr. Vandenberg? have an exact date, but it's going to have to be quite soon. It'll be a small office. It'll be simply a, 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 an administrative or, a, let us say, a, a, a seasonal office to, to have boots on the ground and, and administer stuff directly from there, and that's, that's, uh, we think that's important. Thank you, Mr. Vandenberg. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, in the presentation, it says that basically you think you can make money by operating it uh, this summer. So. Um, Presumably you've got some kind of a business plan, and can you share that with committee? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Guy. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the uh, works for this season, so we do have uh, some certainty around the work that we'd be procuring for the delivery of fuel, for example, so we do know the order of magnitude of business there and between that and the dry cargo that's typically available, we see revenues of around seven to eight million. Uh, we also have a number of other uh, traditional procurers of the service through NTCL have come forward with opportunities to uh, use the service to move their fuel and their goods, and we're talking to those folks now, but we do not have contracts in place at this time. The uh, business plan that we have developed is, of course, um, built around um, what it will cost to operate these. We're using, uh, for planning purposes, the rates that existed under our old contract uh, prior to the uh, 2016 uh, escalation. So really 2014, 2015 rates were using for a business plan development, and that's what our costing is being done around. We are expecting that uh, it will uh, be revenue neutral for sure this year, and going forward, there are opportunities, depending on the amount of additional business, to uh, generate excess revenues that can be used to uh, fund uh, uh, and uh, operate the re rehabilitate. Again, we need to come forward with a more concrete model for future years, and it will depend on what the operating model that we determine that is the most appropriate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Again, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, that's great information, but will the minister commit then to sharing this business plan with the committee? I'd like to hear from the minister. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. O'Reilly. Minister Schumann. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I can uh, say we can uh, share our revenue projections and our expense projections for this year, so we can get that together for committee to have a look at. Thank you, Mr. Schumann. Mr. O'Reilly. Thank you. Uh, for that commitment. Uh, um, in uh, the presentation, you mentioned that you think you can go after the federal government for some of the environmental liabilities at the site. Uh, this entity ha was not hasn't been operated as a Crown Corporation for decades. So uh, what makes you think that we can still go after the federal government for some of the environmental liabilities? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. O'Reilly. Mr. Guy. Um, th thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't have the, the details, but we have been working closely with the Department of Lands, and they believe that there is opportunities through the devolution final agreement um, that, that we may be able to pursue some of those liabilities. 
We're also going back, uh, we'll be able to go through uh, once we get uh, access to the records and uh, documents that we did buy all the records as well. There's warehouses and boxes full of records associated with um, the NTCL assets and we will be able to start looking for old reports and old um, environmental condition reports that will perhaps document pre-existing conditions as well. So we have a lot of work to do on the historical research, uh, but the uh, advice we are getting from both the Department of Justice and Department of Lands is there is opportunities to pursue uh, some of these environmental liability costs. We still have to do more work on that. Um, and we would have likely have ended up with these properties had the company defaulted and abandoned them through the normal uh, process as we have seen with other failed businesses in the NWT. Um, and we were being prepared to pursue those uh, uh, liability uh, obligations with the federal government anyway, so we're just continuing on with the work that we were preparing for anyway, uh, that, whether we had bought them or not. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. McNeely. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, on page 23 here, you identified that you hired somebody for your um, marine crews. Who is that? individual or who, who is that company? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. McNeely. Mr. <coughs> Mr. Vandenberg? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we've been engaging and uh, we, we don't have a contract in place yet, to be frank, but uh, we've been engaging with uh, a company called uh, uh, Offshore Recruitment Services International. Uh, they provide uh, crewing services to uh, offshore oil and they do uh, work around the world. They've uh, worked in the Northwest Territories before with uh, a number of companies, uh, some of the companies we know, but uh, I, uh, I would say that they're uh, extremely professional. They work with uh, Hibernia and Hebron and the, all the, the big companies, uh, big oil majors, etc., off the coast of the, off the East Coast, and we're confident in their ability to uh, not only do this work and do it safely, but also uh, hire the people that we, we've been speaking of earlier today and hire the right people who are, have decades of experience in operating this equipment. Mr. Vandenberg, Mr. McNeely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as part of in preparation to your planning as we speak here on the startup for your 2017 sailing season, you're, you're going to run into some cost here, uh, including probably the highest one would be the recertification of all these assets to to uh, ensure that Transport Canada is, is is satisfied with your compliance and maybe even possibilities of uh, grandfathering or looking at double haul fuel tanks. Is there an expected cost, startup cost, that you anticipate for that? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. McNeely. Uh, Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On uh, slide 24, is, uh, the 884000 is the projected cost that, that it's going to take to uh, get us carry us through this business here to 2017's fiscal end. 17 18, we've asked for 14 million based on what our projected cost would be for labor, uh, fuel, uh, insurance, all these sort of things moving forward. And like the Deputy Minister said in his presentation, if, uh, if we don't expend all those uh, expenditures in the coming years, 2017, 2018, we'll be returning that money back to the department. Uh, this is a very fluid situation. We got to uh, uh, get things going. There's going to be there's some uncertainty around certain things, uh, and pr primarily on the amount of freight and uh, what kind of uh, costs are associated with that, and other people approaching us on what we can do for them. So. I think we've covered our bases by asking a significant ask of $14 million for this year's operating season, and then a lot of that's based on, on some historical costs of, uh, of operating the fleet and staffing. So I think we've uh, pretty much covered ourselves off on most of that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Schumann. Mr. McNeely. Well, my last uh, question possibly there, Mr. Chair, uh, looking at page five here, the previous contract was for uh, hauling fuel there. For 4.1, I'm hoping that the department would take that in consideration and use it as a target to maintain to ensure that the levels of retail prices downtown Fort Good Hope and Toledo are not uh, going higher because you uh, chose to pay your marine staff $20 versus the 15 that was underneath the original contract. So I just bring that out as a point of notice there and a target for for uh, for a benchmarking on, on, on the previous contract. If they can do it for that price. Hopefully we can as well to ensure prices are 
possibly, preferably going lower. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McNeely. Mr. Guy. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, that's the thinking that we have as well. We're using those benchmark costs from what we had in our, our original contract with the previous carrier as the baseline for which we're going to develop the, the rates going forward. And from that, we're building our business model around. And we think that uh, that we can certainly hold those rates stable uh, and, uh, and depending on how much business we'll see going forward with the whether we can uh, do a better job at this and uh, build a build a more self-sustaining uh, business that can provide uh, stability around those rates. So that's our goal is to stabilize the rates. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Uh, guy. Um, um, you know, I can go back I and speak to the certification issue. Okay, Mr. McNeely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, can can you provide Mr. Vanderberg provide us provide committee with the opportunity once you get your your operating personnel in place here, so that we can use that as a contact to pass on to our local governments and uh, and communities in case uh, some of them might want to join your 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 staff there. Uh, there's a lot of young individuals there in Good Hope and in the Saudi communities that may want to take up uh, marine careers. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. McNeely. Mr. Guy. Um, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, that's one of the things that we can certainly add to our website, and we will share with the committee uh, contact information for uh, any crewing opportunities, as well as the sailing schedule. We would uh, appreciate the support of uh, uh, any way we can getting information out around uh, the sailing schedule and that this service will be available. We're getting lots of concerns and questions, and we are working on messaging to do that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Gim, Mr. Natalie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, yeah, I think the, the efforts that we made in terms of you know, taking over uh, the assets of uh, NTCL, and uh, we realize that it's critical services of providing fuel, which is the main concern. but. It's almost, it seems that, you know, on one hand, uh, you know, we're uh, you know, continuing our reliance on uh, fossil fuels, namely uh, fuel uh, for communities that are really remote. And um, I'm just trying to understand, uh, in terms of the initial attempts to at least come up with a management plan in terms of the first year of operation, surely they must have uh, realized perhaps some of the long-term vision into trying to get these communities in terms of moving into um, more alternative energies instead of relying on uh, you know, fuel. Has that been contemplated? And is that something maybe you cite as something that uh, you know, the department has to also work on with, along with those other communities that are remote and rely on fuel? Thank you, Mr. Hi. Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as the committee is well aware, uh, the Department of Public Works is also in charge of our energy strategy. We're out for public consultation on that. Uh, we're meeting with a number of stakeholders. Hopefully we're going to finish up the next couple of communities here in the next short while. And uh, along with ENR and the federal government at the table, bring, bring the, those, those, those issues forward and how we do that. Um, as far as getting the communities off diesel, when we consider when we're buying NTCL, this was uh, something that had to be addressed in the short term. Uh, to ensure that we have uh, services to, to all these northern communities. Uh, we're still, as much as, as the government is doing a great job trying to get us onto renewables, we still need to be relying on diesel fuel for power generation and uh, basic fuel for our communities. But with that being said, uh, we still have to uh, service our communities as well with deck freight to get uh, food in for cost of living and all these sorts of things. Um, the one opportunity that we could probably look at moving as we move forward now if we're going to be controlling the marine system as, uh, uh, you know, moving of pellets and that sort of stuff and how we can implement them into communities, we sort of have some control on how uh, the movement of goods is going to be in the Northwest Territories with this asset being in our hands. And uh, that will be our job to try to control the cost to keep the cost of living down on everything. So the point's taken, uh, but the department is also working on our energy strategy moving forward. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Schumann. Mr. Nadley. No further questions. Thank you, Mr. Nadley. Mr. Thompson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Um, I'm going to go back to the company that you guys are looking at. There was no northern companies has the skills to do this, or was just strictly looking at uh, international company to uh, provide the service. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Guy. No, sorry, uh, Mr. Vandenberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as I say, at this time, we're looking at this company. We haven't engaged with them yet, but we do know that there are no marine crewing companies established in the Northwest Territories. Uh, a company such as this is experienced, and they will hire the northerners who are qualified that we're looking for here, the Northwest Territories residents, that is. However, having said that, uh, the com a company like this is experienced in managing logistics for people moving across the country, dealing with Transport Canada and medical issues, dealing with liability insurance. They take complete responsibility for uh, safety of life at sea with regards to the crews. Uh, this is a, a delicate operation in many ways, and at the, in this initial stage, we did not feel that we, we felt that it was most important to hire quality and a quality, a quality of a company that has had experience working in the Northwest Territories before. Now, going forward, I think we need to look at other models and we need to determine whether or not there's an, uh, other opportunities. Uh, at this point, in the short run, I think it's important to do. Oh, sorry, excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Vandenberg. Uh, Minister Schumann, do you have anything to add? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, from all the time that I spent down at NTCL before I got elected, that uh, someone might have to correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe they used a crewing company to. Uh, to uh, hired a lot of deckhands and stuff for their boat just because of the lack of access to people that are certified to operate in the Northwest Territories. We've committed, like we said, to use as many Northerners as possible that are certified and that can get on these boats. But I think moving forward as, uh, as we roll out our business plans and how we're going to operate this thing and share with committee, I think that's some of the ideas of how do we train our people to, uh, to uh, access to get on and have jobs on these, to be captains, mates, uh, deckhands as such and uh, potentially how we even operate uh, the synchro lift in Hay River and the opportunities that are there for northerners to be employed in this operation. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Schumann. Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I thank you for the answer. I'm just not going to get into semantics here because I'm just – I think northerners can be out there, and I think there are some northerners that have lost – Ferry positions that were captains and first mates that could have been used and being looked at. Um, how is the union being worked with? Like, so we have union staff that you know represent the staff that were laid off, and how are they being engaged in this process? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Mr. Vandenberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we uh, through uh, the the company that I mentioned, uh, we have uh, they have engaged the union. These people, of course, would be employees of the, uh, the company, not of the GNWT, and therefore it is appropriate that the uh, that the unions uh, be uh, be discussions between that company and the unions take place. However, I can tell you that we have had discussions, or this company has had discussions in our presence, and they've been amicable. And there are there certainly is every effort to uh, let us say uh, to to, to to reach an amicable relationship with the unions. And as we know, those unions represent the very people of whom we speak, many of whom are Northerners. So there is no attempt here to, to, uh, to, to, to look for a, a discount crew or, or some sort of means of, uh, of, of uh, we, we will be looking for professional crews and the professional crews that are hired through unions such as the, the Merchants Guild and the Seafarers International Union. Thank you, Mr. Vandenberg. Mr. Thompson. Uh, thank you. And I that's a good answer, and I'm happy to hear that, and hopefully our northerners are out there looking at it. Um, when you talked about the environment and you talked about old files and you're looking back into this, how long is this going to take? Because we're talking 80 years of files, or are we talking 60 years of files, 30 years of files, and how many staff are we going to need to get this done? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Guy. Uh, Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we don't know yet how many files we'll have to go through. We just know there are a lot of them, but we're not holding, waiting for the files. We are going to be doing the ESAs to establish the baselines and to determine the extent of the, the remediation required, and we'll use some of the historical information to help build the case around who should ultimately be responsible for it. So, thank you, okay. Mr. Chair. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I think we're going to run out of time here, but I still have lots of questions uh, about how the feds may be on the hook for some of these sites. I want to know whether those sites are covered by the devolution agreement. If they're not, we're, we could be in big trouble. 
Uh, I'm also have questions about the petroleum product stabilization fund and uh, what impact uh, this is going to have on that. But most importantly, I go back to what the minister said about this being very fluid. We had actually asked for this briefing before Christmas. Great that we're getting it now. And look, I know you're, you guys are flat out working on this. But what we need, I think, is regular reports to committee about what's going on, and whether they need to be monthly initially and then move to quarterly, but we need to have detailed reports about what's going on because I want to know early on if there's any warning signs that something's going off the rails. So I'm asking the minister to commit to early and regular reporting to this committee. Maybe it needs to be monthly at the beginning and then move to quarterly, but we need to have detailed reports for what's going on. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'll, I'll duly noted. We'll go back and discuss uh, how uh, things are progressing here, and we'll get back to committee when we want, when we get back in front of you guys and give you some detailed information on on how things are rolling out. Uh, I'm not going to say it's monthly or weekly or what we're going to do, but uh, I'm sure we're going to all have uh, conversations. You can stop by my office, and we'll we, there's no we have no intention of hiding anything. We need to have committee's input on this as we move forward. Uh, this is something that took place that we had to take to protect the citizens of the Northwest Territories and. Uh, it's, uh, it happened in a timely manner that wasn't quite conducive to getting in front of committee right away over the Christmas holidays and stuff, but uh, I will commit to getting back to the committee uh, on a timely basis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Schumann. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, we have no more questions uh, from the floor. Uh, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't see you, Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson. Put my hand up right when I was done last time. One more about jobs. So uh, you said that the crewing service... I, I, I was, you told me there's no assurances that uh, there will be northern hires, of course, by the fact that there's people with experience there will be northern hires, but we even have aspirational quotas for the mines for northern hires. So can we not get something like that to, uh, from public works, from, the, the, uh, from our own government? Um, you know, that's, that's more of a comment. Uh, or if you want to commit to that, I'd be happy to. But how many seasonal positions will be created this upcoming shipping season? Thank you. Mr. Vanderberg? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I can speak to that. Um, you do know that you've, uh, you've seen the numbers for our, um, uh, the um, appropriation, and the appropriation is certainly uh, dependent upon uh, the supplement, uh, supplement is dependent upon the, the, the amount of business we get. Now, it's certainly absolutely important that we focus on our core business, that is, our resupply to our communities. Uh, beyond that, uh, the a number of staff that will be hired proportional to the appropriation, uh, it, it really does depend on uh, the, the, the business. Uh, let, let us say, opportunities that we choose to take advantage of, keeping in mind that we aren't going to put anything at risk, such as the communities, our communities first. So the staff will be proportional, again, to the amount of, of business that we choose to do or is, 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 is thrust upon us going forward. Um, I, I know that's maybe not an accurate answer, but I would say that uh, it, it's enough to say that the staff could be, uh, it's difficult to put an estimate on it right now. Each vessel would need a certain number of staff, seven to eight probably. Uh, we would also have maintenance staff, et cetera, but it will be proportionally amount of business going forward. So. Thank you, Mr. Vandenberg. Anything to add, Minister Schumann? Chair, sure. I think uh, this would be something we could bring forward the next time we update committee when we have a better idea of uh, where things are going, then we can give you an idea of what's, what's going on with staffing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Schumann. Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> I recognize we're probably over time, but... Yeah, I see here that the environmental site assessments are going to take place over the next three summers, and then it says that there's going to be uh, – they, they need to be done so we can make informed decisions. So can we expect at least three years before anything happens with any of the lands uh, in Hay River and the other uh, assets purchased from NTCL? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Mr. Guy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. No, we'll prioritize those, uh, the ones that we think are more likely to have uh, contaminants. We'll do those first, and mm -hmm. there's no reason that if action needs to be taken on those, it can't be taken sooner. Uh, then we don't have to wait till it's all done. These are our individual sites. There's 27 different parcels, I think, so uh, it's not something that has to wait till all of that is done. As we know more, and certainly we can share the information as, we, as it becomes available and as part of updating the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Guy. Mr. Simpson. Uh, is there, uh, can municip municip municipalities be assured that they will not inherit any of the environmental liabilities associated with any of the lands that uh, the JNWT purchased from NTCL? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Mr. Guy. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm not. I don't have an answer to that question. I'll have to check with the Department of Lands whether there's a. I'm not sure if we own the if we own the property. It's a GNWT asset, so I mean the liabilities uh, aren't there. I'm not sure if there's a land that's leased from the community governments. What what uh, is involved there? But I think that. Uh, uh, we would have to find that out. I can't assure what could and couldn't happen because I don't know the process uh, at that level of detail at this point. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Guy. Um, Mr. Simpson, there's nobody else on the list. Do you have any more questions? Um, you mentioned that there's a cargo office now open in Hay River. So is this because a lot of the, the contracts, the, the RFPs that the government puts out, they require barging? And for a while, there was nowhere for someone to call to get a quote if they, if they wanted to put an RFP to see how much something would barge cost of barge. And so is this where businesses or individuals would contact and where can they find that contact information? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Mr. Guy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, we have a website we're just about ready to put up uh, online. Uh, we're just going through the final edits on it. It has the 1-800 number that will ring through to that office and that's where those quotes will be provided from. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Simpson. Um, for, the, for us, the assets that don't require environmental site uh, assessments, you know, some of the, the, the other assets. When will the government be in a position to start uh, selling those? Because I know there's local businesses who have uh, expressed interest in purchasing some of the assets that aren't needed for operations. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Mr. Guy. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. As we develop the long-term plan, we'll again identify all the assets, both mobile and uh, real property assets. And really right now that they are owned by the GNWT, they will fall under real property Disposal policy, which is on our website, and that's the process that would likely be used going forward to dispose of those. Obviously, we'll develop a plan and bring that back as well for disposal of non-core assets, but there is a disposal process in place for any surplus GNWT assets, and that's what we'll be following. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Guy. We've got a couple of minutes. Mr. Simpson? Uh, well, I think we have to get ready for uh, sitting in the House, so I'll, I'll leave it at that, and I'll definitely follow up more with the Department. There's a lot of unanswered questions still. But uh, I'll, uh, I'll make a commitment to my constituents to get answers to them and uh, report back. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for, uh, for appearing before us. Thank you, uh, Mr. Simpson. With that, I'd like to thank uh, Minister Schumann and, uh, and his staff uh, for a presentation. Very informative. Thank you.